Item number, SCP-7027. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. Provisional containment site 95 has been constructed near SCP-7027's point of terrestrial origin. Due to the relative isolation of Site-95 and the passive nature of Group of Interest, GOI-0184, slash SCP-7021-1, minimal security is required. As of 2021, interacting with GOI-0184 is prohibited. Observation is to continue remotely as long as it does not disrupt the practices of GOI-0184. Refusal to comply with non-intervention will result in termination. Site-95 is to remain active to ensure the continued containment of SCP-7027-2. Research into SCP-7027-2 is to remain on hold for the foreseeable future. Description SCP-7027 is an anomalous phenomenon which primarily manifests as a process of physical transfiguration and psychological augmentation by members of a monastic order located in the Kirakora mountain range. Individuals affected by SCP-7027 are classified as SCP-7027-1. The first stage of the anomaly's expression is a black circular dot with a diameter of 15 to 25 millimeters, which appears in the center of an individual's forehead. This mark superficially resembles a decorative bindi, but is irremovable unless surgically excised shortly after it is detected. As SCP-7027 progresses, it consumes the face of its host causing the front of the skull to sink inwards. Eventually, the skull collapses into a void of indeterminate depth before slowly spreading to the rest of the body. Flesh blackened by SCP-7027 does not reflect light and will, over a period of time, develop holes and fissures that further disfigure the affected individual. Like the aperture that consumes much of the host's head, the holes display anomalous interior dimensions. Objects introduced into these voids are ultimately unrecoverable. Cavities created by SCP-7027 produce a continuous discharge. The emanations behave in a manner consistent with a hot gas or plasma, but appear almost completely opaque. The edges of these emanations are semi-translucent and blur or distort the surrounding space. All efforts to collect a sample have failed, leaving its chemical composition, if any, unknown. Despite this resistance to analysis, it has been discovered that the temperature around the fissures steadily decreases. Approaching absolute zero as the SCP-7027-1 instance enters the final stage of infection, at which point disintegration occurs. Testing in sealed and sterilized vacuum containment units has determined that no detectable trace of SCP-7027-1 remains after this final event. The progression of SCP-7027 violates the law of conservation of mass, with the subatomic particles composing SCP-7027-1 undergoing annihilation without the apparent introduction of their respective antiparticles. The transformation occurs over decades and inevitably results in the destruction of vital organs, including the brain and heart. By this stage, SCP-7027-1 are clinically deceased, requiring neither sleep nor sustenance. Subjects remain ambulatory and continue to wander the monastery when not seated in meditation. The Foundation has yet to uncover the source or cause of SCP-7027, but physical symptoms of infection follow only after the monks have confined themselves within their cells in the monastery for some time. Cell interiors are just large enough to allow for meditation and function as a form of sensory deprivation. The monks believe that, by immersing themselves in darkness, they allow their bodies to become its host. Multiple reports from personnel at Site-95 describe unconfirmed paranormal encounters but the ephemeral nature of these incidents render them unconducive to repeat experimentation and classification. The following is a list of common, unconfirmed reports by Site-95 personnel. Sightings of mobile humanoid shadows without apparent source. High frequency of night terrors and sleep paralysis. Sudden transitory cold spots within insulated and heated sections of Site-95. Intermittent radio interference in and around the monastery. The appearance and rapid disappearance of black stains throughout the monastery, though these may represent an unknown species of slime mold. Long-term personnel report a steady degradation in feelings of self-worth during routine psychological examinations, though this is possibly a mundane reaction to observing the practices and traditions of GOI-0184. Discovery 
The Foundation became aware of SCP-7027 in 1956, following reports of unusual disfigurements occurring among members of an isolated Buddhist sect in Tibet. Due to the singular nature of their philosophy, the sect and monastery had no formal name, but the residents of neighboring villages commonly referred to them as the Empty Ones. Classified as GOI-0184, the order practices an extreme form of asceticism and forbids the use of personal names, depictions of the human form, or even the preservation of its own history. It is believed by members of GOI-0184 that enlightenment can only be achieved through drastic humility. To do this, they must purge of vanity and pride, with corporeal existence regarded as the final arrogance to be undone. Through SCP-7027, the monks believe they can permanently escape samsara, the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Despite their surface resemblance to other Buddhist sects, GOI-0184 bears many significant deviations. For example, the monks of GOI-0184 believe in Akriyavada, a heretical doctrine which claims that moral acts have no consequences and therefore no influence on rebirth. Unlike most monastic traditions of the region, GOI-0184 includes both men and women, many of which are initiated as children. All are expected to practice the same level of asceticism, regardless of age, gender, or physical health. This life of austerity includes the renunciation of material possessions, avoidance of physical pleasures, and meager diets that leave members in a state of chronic starvation, though though many of the symptoms associated with severe ionization. Members of GOI-0184 practice ritual self-mortification, believing that pain, humiliation, self-denial, and disfigurement aid in the destruction of ego. Prior to containment, methods of humiliation often involve visiting neighboring villages where the monks would remove their clothes, smear themselves in dirt and ash, and non-verbally beg or incite the locals into physically assaulting them. Despite frequent injuries and infection, this behavior has never been observed to result in fatalities, and the villagers regard their actions as part of a tradition beneficial to the monks, as opposed to violence committed out of sincere ire. GOI-0184 does not actively recruit, and instead receives initiates by anomalous means. Newly arrived members have refused to communicate, suggesting a priori knowledge of at least some of the Order's tenants. As they are unwilling to divulge information, their reasons for joining are unknown. It is presently hypothesized that SCP-7027's influence extends beyond the monastery and is capable of compelling certain individuals to join through anomalous suggestion or possibly even direct control. The Foundation allows these supplicants with Insight 95 as they provide a steady flow of SCP-7027-1 specimens for research, who willingly accept their permanent containment, and do not interfere with the work of personnel. Due to the region's extreme terrain, it is possible that some of those called to the monastery do not survive the journey. As all members appear to be of the Tibetan or Nepalese descent, it is likely that SCP-7027's reach is limited to the region or determined by a genetic component, but it is also possible that these common elements are purely coincidental. The single exception to this pattern is instance number 251. See incident log dated September 12, 1997 for more information. The monks of GOI-0184 maintain a vow of silence, leaving only a single person to represent and speak for the sect. Rendered the de facto leader of GOI-0184, this individual classified as Person of Interest, POI-539, refers to himself as Bodhisattva, whose position requires that he refrain from certain aspects of the faith in order to facilitate the path to nirvana for other monks, a practice not unheard of, and which can be found in the Mahayana tradition of Buddhism. As a result, POI-539 has avoided infection by SCP-7027, though he intends to seek a successor in order to begin the process. Addendum 7027-A Interview with POI-539 The following log is a transcript of an interview with POI-539 conducted by Dr. Jonathan Isaac on June 22, 1956. POI-539 is a Tibetan man estimated between the age of 50 and 60. Like other members of GOI-0184, all efforts to find further identification have failed. As he otherwise lives by the tenets of the Order, his body is malnourished and covered with self-inflicted wounds. 
Interview conducted in and translated from Lhasa, Tibetan. Log begins. Am I to understand that you have no name? You must have had a life before coming here. We are a slate wiped clean. Past is erased along with the name. There is only the way. If this one must be labeled, but a zatva will suffice for it is this one's purpose. No, that won't be necessary, POI 539. Simply a matter of record, though not required. Please, tell me about what you mean by the way. We follow the way of the Black Buddha to exist, to impose yourself on reality is the foundational conceit upon which all suffering is derived. It is not a path to walk, not a goal to be sought. It is simply surrender. And what do you become? Becoming implies creation. We do not become anything. We are unmade. Void embraces us. It is a truth without color, or shape. It permeates, festers, soaks us in darkness. Others would struggle, would cling to the illusion of life. But why this process? There are swifter methods to end your life. You still fail to understand. Death is meaningless. The flesh is returned to the earth. The soul is returned to samsara. The cycle continues. Sacrifice yourself in vain. There is no mercy, no enlightenment in the turning of the wheel. Is existence really so awful? It seems that much of your pain is self-inflicted. Life is suffering, but it is not without a certain insidious beauty. It fascinates, it enthralls, and it binds us to this realm, to fragile and fleeting forms. The illusion is dispelled the moment you recognize it for the falsehood that it is. There can be no return to ignorance, no matter how comforting the lie may be. We seek to escape before the truth is lost to death and rebirth to the ceaseless turning of that hated wheel. I believe I understand you now. But tell me, why this void? Why this method? How does it work? There are three great illusions, three shackles which bind us. Life, the world, and the self. We must surrender to the obliteration of the self if we are ever to transcend. One cannot fight the self, for it feeds on struggle. This tether cannot be broken, but there is a way to slip free. One must sink so low to the darkest, most wretched depths. When we achieve void, that which we manifest is consumed, and a shackle cannot bind what no longer exists. It slips away like rain from our hands, like dust upon a wind. This is the obliteration of the self. I see. That will be all. Thank you for your time. Log ends. Addendum 7027-B. History of GOI-0184. The following document contains information pertaining to the history of GOI-0184. Since GOI-0184's extreme asceticism precludes the creation of physical or oral records of the Order's history, the information herein was gleaned entirely from research performed by the Foundation. 
Investigation of the site with ground penetrating radar detected the presence of man made objects beneath the monastery and its surrounding land. Initial discoveries include a number of large ash deposits containing traces of paper, birch bark, and silk, most likely immolated transcripts, and heavily damaged Buddha statues and murals which have been carbon dated to the 14th century CE. Destroyed statues were found to resemble the Buddha when reconstructed. The figure was seated in a lotus position, but as no fragments of the face were discovered, it is hypothesized that the statues were procured intact, ritually defaced to resemble SCP-7027-1, only to be shattered and buried sometime later. Careful restoration of the murals revealed depictions of robed monks wreathed by an aura of black flame, which are believed to represent SCP-7027. Based on this evidence, it can be surmised that GOI-0184 permitted artistic representations in the past, but adopted an icoism, resulting in or preceding an iconoclastic episode between the 14th and 15th century CE. On April 17, 1987, the monastery was damaged by a natural landslide. As the section was rarely used, there were fortunately no fatalities. The disaster revealed the presence of man-made structures beneath the monastery. Following an archaeological survey of the site, it was determined that the ruins were Epipaleolithic and built not long after the arrival of modern humans of the region. Building material consisted of stone, bone, and clay, though the architecture itself displays a level of ingenuity uncommon among contemporaneous cultures. The structure was built at the mouth of a natural mountain cavern, which contained a gallery of well-preserved cradle art, including a pair of murals. The first depicts a tall glowing humanoid with their left hand over their heart where splashes of red pigment suggest injury, and their right hand extended with the palm facing up. Six smaller humanoids prostrate themselves before the larger figure. Despite its greater size, the tall humanoid is not depicted as domineering, more likely a teacher or spiritual leader than a king or conqueror. A black formless substance rises from the ground and enters the open mouths of the smaller figures. What at first was mistaken for a tail turned out to be a crack in the wall, but its appearance along with the figure's enlightened countenance and pose, has led one Tibetan specialist to make a comparison to a mythical monkey ancestor of the Tibetan people. The second mural displays a complex three-level scenario centered around a tree with deep roots. Viewed from the bottom up, it depicts black serpents gnawing at the roots, which have black veins, perhaps to represent poisoning, infection, or the spread of a curse. The taint rises through the roots, into the second level where the humanoids bite into the roots, removing the taint as someone would suck out venom. The humanoids are missing limbs and bear numerous black spots. The practice of purifying the roots shows to not be without a cost. At the highest level, the tree is healthy and full of leaves, surviving thanks to the sacrifice of those below. If the radiocarbon dating of this site is accurate, it is possible that individuals have been working to contain SCP-7027 for 20,000 years. On September 12, 1997, security officer Wuchas Machaevsky entered the Site-95 infirmary at 0600 hours to request medication for what he believed at the time to be a sinus headache. Medical personnel immediately noticed a black spot on Machaevsky's forehead, and after a thorough physical examination, determined that the subject was infected by SCP-7027 and exhibiting the first visible symptom of transformation into SCP-7027-1. Machaevsky was classified as anomalous and received the designation SCP-7027-1, parenthesis 251, becoming the first and, at present, only recorded case of SCP-7027 infecting someone outside of GOI-0184. SCP-7027-1 cooperated with containment and observation and became a critical source of information due to being free of GOI-0184's vow of silence. The following log is a transcript of an interview with SCP-7027-1 conducted by Dr. Su Maezawa on September 13, 1997. Log begins. may be regarded as unprofessional, but I wish to offer my sincerest apology. Had we known the anomaly could affect individuals outside GOI-0184, we would have certainly taken stronger safety precautions. You. 
couldn't have known. Well, we will do everything we can to undo your predicament and hopefully prevent this from happening in the future. Okay, with that said, I wish to ask you a few questions about the days preceding your diagnosis. Did you by any chance directly interact with any instance of SCP-70271? Any physical contact? No. Okay, and what of the monastery itself? Did you ever access the inner walls? Just routine patrols. Never lingered long. Well, how do you feel? You seem rather calm considering the gravity of the situation. I don't feel anything. But I know I should. I should feel horror. But instead, I I feel nothing at all. Do you have a history of depression? No. This isn't a familiar experience. So we can probably assume that this is a symptom. And I should feel angry. Angry that I can't feel, right? I know what my brain wants. It wants to scream. It wants to rage. But instead, nothing. Just emptiness. It's like trying to locate a word in the dictionary, only to find that it's been cut out. Now there's just a hole. Log ends. By early 1998, SCP-7027 had spread to SCP-7027-1, parenthesis 251's left eye, and formed a vein that wrapped around the subject's neck and connected to a newly formed black mark located at the cervical region of the spine. He occasionally reports head pain, before expelling dark smoke and sludge from his mouth, with both substances' forms evaporating too rapidly to allow analysis. Subject suffers frequent and violent tremors, causing the body to contort unnaturally, and for the subject to walk with a stiff, shambling gait. Since SCP-7027-1 belonged to GOI-0184 did not display similar reactions, it is possible that their teachings and practices, such as meditation, ultimately allows them to better tolerate the effects of SCP-7027. The following log is a transcript of an interview with SCP-7027-1, parentheses 251, conducted by Dr. Sue Maezawa on February 5th, 1998. Log begins. Hello, SCP-7027-251. I would like to ask you a few questions. The subject is curled on the floor, staring at the ceiling with their remaining eye. You're clearly in a state of acute distress. I've been told you received morphine this morning. Has it helped? No. Okay. On a scale from 1 to 10, how would you describe your pain? 1 being the lowest level of discomfort, and 10 being- There is no scale that could possibly capture the pain I feel at this moment. I'll just write you down as a 10. You again display unusual calm and clarity, despite your ongoing predicament. There's... a separation. suffers a coughing fit, causing black smoke to emanate from both natural and SCP-7027 created orifices. We can end the interview early if you need rest. He wipes a black smear from his mouth and chin and shakes his head. No. But what else can I say? The monks. They can take a decade to change. It's been, what, only a year? Actually, you've been in containment for about five months. Is Khan on duty? Can you ask him to put a bullet through my head? Though I'm guessing it will be just another hole with my condition, right? We believe that to be the case, yes. 
I will bring up your request for merciful termination to the director, but I can't make any promises. Log ends. Researchers observing SCP-7027-1 251's progress noted that its body warped in conjunction with each new hole. Each grew in circumference at a rate of approximately 1.3 centimeters a year and fused the subject to the containment room floor. The subject's significant deviation from other instances of SCP-7027-1 presented an opportunity for further research into the nature of the anomaly. Officer Wukash Mechaevsky's request for assisted suicide was never presented to the director of the site or the O5 Council. Prior to the cessation of brain activity, the subject developed symptoms of dementia and acute memory loss. Though it is unknown if these were caused directly by SCP-7027 or were a natural response to SCP-7027-induced trauma. By the year 2000, SCP-7027-1 parenthesis 251 lost the ability to see but retained its mouth and right ear. The following log is a transcript of the interview with SCP-7027-1, parenthesis 251, conducted by Dr. Su Maezawa on December 23, 2000. Log begins. Hello, SCP-7027-1251. It's that time again. How do you feel? Would you kindly describe your recent experiences? The shadows won't stop. They reach inside and take and take. Green claws that scrape and tear. I bleed for you, but all I have to offer is dust and oil. And the pain? No need for a scale, just describe it as best you can. Oh, that. A part of me is in agony, but that part is falling deeper and deeper. <laughs> Suddenly the subject shudders as the holes in its body swell and vibrate. Jesus Christ! What the hell? Uh, how afraid you must be. <laughs> the subject vomits black slime reminiscent of unrefined crude oil into its cupped hands. How clumsy of me. A cool sludge moves beneath my skin. As I remember, it was always there. The subject smears the substance across the floor where it rapidly evaporates. You mentioned shadows a moment ago. Do you see something? I don't have eyes. You can't just assume that. That's... Do you see something? The irregular holes in the subject's head move slightly from side to side as it flexes what remains of its face. There are scary shapes in the darkness. Yellow carapaces. Pale gold. A hundred bodies. Each with a hundred legs. It was sacred once. I know this now. Memories were lost in that trade. <laughs> like centipedes? And, and who were they sacred to? Can you smell my fumes? It's incense. Did you know that? Like opium, and myrrh, and ancient books. It lingers on my tongue and tastes like forgotten dreams. It's not my memory. Something else remembers it. Something down. Deep below. Who remembers? The librarians. It reminds them of the kingdom under the mountain. It reminds 
them of a home. My home was a cage. Where they are, it just feels like one. The dog. And cold deserves. That's all that matters. The subject slumps against its own twisted mass, losing consciousness. Log ends. SCP-7027-1, parenthesis 251, did not regain consciousness for 14 days and was unaware of its last conversation, displaying increased memory loss and confusion. By late 2001, the subject's lower body and left arm coalesced into a shapeless, hardened mound. Its remaining epidermis turned gray and began to crack. The following log is a transcript of the final interview with SCP-7027-1, parenthesis 251. Conducted by Dr. Su Mayazawa on October 23, 2001. Log begins. Hello, SCP-7027-1251. Are you able to communicate today? <laughs> Do you remember my voice? Do you know who this is? Mommy? It's cool. It's so cool. Please, let me in. Let me in. It, no, no, th- I'm sorry. It's Sui. Do you remember your name? The memory of a memory of a memory. Then nothing. Subjects anomalous orifices strain and expand, sending additional cracks through its desiccated flesh. <laughs> Describe what you feel. Are you there, Majewski? What do you mean? Do you mean the monks, or...? The new king made them forget what the old king showed them. When they found the truth again, they buried it. The rituals remain, but they don't know what it means. Better not to know. That's our blessing. Then it curse. Flesh to sponge up so much nothing. What a filthy, polluted, dirty It is a It's not. It looks like me. But it's not. I'm a whole, but I'm not the darkness. Then what is it? It's an eclipse. Did you not know? The highest day. A city of knowledge of secrets and forgotten things. And it casts a long, long shadow. Under the corpse light of their failed black sun, you would never know. It was your. Log ends. SCP-7027-1 Parenthesis 251's body collapsed, starting with its head, 
and spread across the containment chamber as its void apertures merge to create a single portal now designated SCP-7027-2. Unlike other instances of SCP-7027-1, SCP-7027-1-251 failed to fully annihilate, and its remaining husk formed a perfect ring with a radius of 3.2 meters. SCP-7027-2's interior displays properties identical to smaller SCP-7027 void apertures. Due to SCP-7027-2's size and apparent stability, unmanned exploration was deemed feasible. SCP-7027-2's interior environment is hazardous to organic life, but exhibits conditions similar to the vacuum of space, with temperatures in the vicinity of 1 Kelvin. Despite these similarities, there's nothing else to suggest that SCP-7027-2 connects to outer space as no stars have been observed from within. Though no conclusive evidence has been discovered, the most likely hypothesis is that SCP-7027-2 leads to a dimension outside our own. There does exist a downward gravitational pull, but its source is yet to be discovered. Considering these factors, it was determined that the best method to survey SCP-7027-2's interior would be through a remote probe designed for long-term space exploration. On April 10, 2002, at 0900 hours, this probe was released into SCP-7027-2. Site-95 did not receive any notable transmissions from the probe until July 16, 2020 more than 18 years after its deployment. Collected data includes a number of images taken over a 12-second period before all contact with the probe was lost. Images depicted a gold-colored artificial structure forming a sprawling metropolis. These images took approximately 46 hours to reach 95. Presuming no time dilation effects are present within SCP-7027-2, this indicates they were sent from approximately 332 astronomical units, or 31 billion miles away. Further research is pending.